around. We'll go around there and have a look. And I think we just use a direct approach and just go in and just... just yeah, just bluff our way. Just, you know, like, just say hi, look, we just want to go in. We're not going to harm anyone. We're not going to take up much room. We'll just say hello to everyone. Yeah, we just want to have a good time. Yeah. The members stand, yeah, right through there. Oh, excuse me. Straight down there. Right. All right. Right. Straight down there. Right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Here we go. Excuse me, madam. I see your badge, please. Australia is the only country in the world which virtually stops for a horse race. But then, of course, the Melbourne Cup really is much more than just a horse race. It's a national event, rich in history, in a country which doesn't have very much history. And also, strangely perhaps, it's a cohesive force for Australians because it's one day in the year when most of us share the one common interest. And best of all, it's a lot of fun. When the famous American writer Mark Twain visited Australia on the first Tuesday of November in 1895, he described it as the great annual day of sacrifice. He saw the Melbourne Cup as the Australasian National Day, not only overshadowing all other holidays and special days, but in fact, blotting them out. Today, nothing has changed. Cup Day, said Mark Twain, was supreme. He could call to mind no comparable day in any other country, and that, remember, was 1895. So the Melbourne Cup has been spared the trauma of future shock. It is still the pagan rite of spring, the biggest maypole in the world. Cheers, Mike. All the best. Derek Nemo. Derek, what brings you all the way from the beautiful weather and conditions of England to put up with the misery of a Melbourne Cup? Well, it's my eighth Melbourne Cup, so it's um, not a very difficult decision for me. I always try to arrange my life so that I'm handily adjacent. Uh, to Australia around the first week in November. You really take it seriously, don't you? Well, you know, fairly seriously. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what is this? Well, well these are just money I've lost all over the world, right, I suppose. Epsom, Asker, Wanganui. <laughs> It helps good. you gain access to places when you flash Well, that that's up. right, because as soon as you arrive at a gate, you just do that, and the fellow can never be bothered to look through it. And I think <laughs> I have got the right badge, but they never look through it. Derek, when you explain to someone in England or anywhere else in the world about the Melbourne Cup, and they don't know anything about it, what do you say? Well, I say it's like a great big sort of um, bar mitzvah, a mixture of a bit of Easter, really, and the Mardi Gras, all rolled into one, and they chuck in a few horses for good measure. <laughs> Forgetting that the Melbourne Cup is basically a horse race, oh, taking yes. the larger view, how would you compare the Melbourne Cup with any other festivals or events or happenings overseas? Well, I think the only thing that we've ever had in Europe, which has been in any way like it, has been the Nuremberg Rally. The Cup was first run in 1861. And every year since, Melbourne's leading hotels have been fully booked for the occasion. It's customary to stay in the same hotel each year, so there's a familiarity. It's all part of the ritual. The Melbourne Cup is attracting an increasing number of overseas visitors, but if they expect to see the egalitarian society on which Australia prides itself, then they've picked the wrong day. This is one day when, on the surface, the class system seems alive and style is everything. But even a Rolls-Royce has to battle traffic, which at this moment is choking all roads leading to Flemington Racecourse. If there is a best way to get to the Cup, 
then maybe it's by boat along the Maribyrnong River. The Amada ties up within 100 metres of the grandstand. Cup day is an organiser's nightmare, saved by the VRC's enormous experience. One requirement is an army of determined gate men. And to Jackie and Fleur, that's quite a challenge. I'm waiting for my wife. I can't get in, you see, then that's she the gets trouble. Kicked out. I can't get in, yeah. Right. That's why I'm waiting outside. No, she doesn't have to come out. We'll go back we'll in take and give it back, back to her. Plus, remember, she's getting caught doing that, getting the heaps of trouble. Oh. But find another husband waiting for his wife, who's a member. Right. As soon as she comes out, that's when you'll get the badge. If you want to experience Cup Day in the grand manner, then you must get a ticket to the member's enclosure. These tickets are literally worth their weight in gold. They denote privilege, position and prestige. The Magical Members Ticket provides access to the most exclusive array of people ever to gather at the one time in Australia. And the social nerve centre in the members' enclosure is right here, the Champagne Bar. Yeah. Judith has been pouring champagne here for as long as I can remember. She sees people who wouldn't tolerate a dropped spoon in a restaurant endure all manner of indignity for the privilege of simply being here. The noise, the heat, the jostling and crowding, the spillage, the standing, nothing matters. This is the champagne bar on Cup Day. Pretty crowded, isn't it? Why are you laughing? That's not a very funny line, Bing. <laughs> Annie! I've been so happy lately. I'm so happy. And this is my first Melbourne Cup. I know, it is. I've never been here before. I, I rang you last year and said, you've got to come. And I'm just supposed to. I know, and Don't I was just going to And you know what? I've got my own horses. Please. I've got four. You're four two. thoroughbreds of my very own. Oh, great. I've got mine from New Zealand up there, too. I know, I heard about it. And you're training it yourself. Yes. Oh, Annie. Is that a one? <laughs> The fashion stakes sometimes appear to be as competitive as the race itself. The lawns in front of the member stand become the catwalk for an amazing display of design and colour. The time, the money and the effort were all spent in the winter. The results now emerge like butterflies on this beautiful spring day. And if a photographer should just happen to notice and have the temerity to ask if he could take a picture, well, what nice girl could say no? To some, it's also good business. Yelena is a couturier and is about to open a new salon. So she and her friend Ruth dress in her own creations. Oh, you've got some fans. Thank you. I have the best job at the Melbourne Cup. I get to be a judge for um, you know, fashions on the field, so I can talk to all the women. That is great. I love the idea. You, you guys. I love, it's not so much as outlandish, but it's well, large. It's, you know? Well, it's a little bit different, yeah. you know. I think as a designer, I should be able to come along and look a little bit different to what I, mean, I, I saw one at. woman here who was so outrageous. She had a, a hat about that wide. Right. I think she should have been flying by the end of the afternoon. I should be 15,000 <laughs> feet off the ground by the time it's over. Yeah, oh, well, who cares? It's that sort of a day. It's all it? fun. Mm. Yeah. Today gives us another strong connection with the early beginnings of Australia, and that's in the gambling. Hunters here and around Australia today will officially spend nearly $70 million on the Melbourne Cup. Now, if you add the unofficial figures, like the, say, one million or so sweeps around Australia, and the illegal bookmakers, what they turn over, we could be getting close to $100 million invested on a horse race today. And people queue for the privilege. To the uninitiated, the betting possibilities are enormously seductive. You can back a horse to win, or just run a place, or both. Then there are the doubles, quinellas, trifectas, and quadrellas. And each year, a new crop of experts set themselves for the kill. But for the bookies, it's Christmas come early. Collectively, they never lose. Bookies are always keen to take your money 
but rarely with the persistence of Rumpty Williamson. He's 88 years of age and still at it. Rumpty is a place bookie, which is not so glamorous, but he appeals to the more cautious punter. Rumpty started in the First World War trenches, taking bets on the Argentinian supply donkeys. He's not been a great winner. Over the years, he's just plugged away and plugging away has won the day. But not for much longer. At the end of this week, one small part of the tradition of the Melbourne Cup will come to an end. Rumpty Williamson is hanging up his bag for the last time. Jackie and Fleur are still determined to con their way into the members. Now they've borrowed jockey silks and charity collection boxes. We were told we could go in through the wire before the car. We have not been notified of them, I'm afraid. Oh, do you have to be notified? Yep. Who do you have to get? Supervisor. Where's the supervisor? You tell me, that's a good question. What about this man over here? Has he got more? It might be quite if you went around the other gate. Try the one around just around here. Another one round there? Yeah. Why, the supervisor might be closer, do you think? Well, there might be one there, yeah. There's normally plenty here. What's the supervisor look like? I've done a big thing with supervisor, but look, I'll tell you now, I cannot let you in this gate. That's it. The hour leading up to the race is a bit like a countdown at Cape Canaveral for those who are serious about the race. And for the rest, it's pure festival. We're now going to witness that hour through the eyes of a range of people, both here at Flemington and other places around Australia. All of us bound together in common cause with but one disagreement. Who will win? 10, 20, 30, 40, 8, 9 dollars, 10, 9 dollars, 10 bid. Wherever you are in Australia at this moment, you're almost certain to stop what you're doing in readiness for the running of the cup. But the men here at this stock auction in the small country town of Blaney have reason not to stop. Severe recession, crippling drought, and the stock is being sold for pittance. But the cup is the cup. They'll stop. Neil, have you had a bet on the cup, old boy? Back Curtis Lane. Why did you back Curtis Lane? Because he's going to win. Because he's going to win. Are you a, bit, a lot better than these sheep back here today. They're not winning too much. Lance, what about dealer's choice, though? Yeah, I think he might, might have a good chance, I yeah, think. Yeah, I think so. He's won one, two, uh, three mile, uh, two milers already. There's, there's only one thing that's wrong. Poor old Smith, he's laying down with influenza today, but I think his horse might get up and give him a shock. He'll cure him. Be like, it'll be just like having Buckley's Canadian old poor down his neck. I think. <laughs> well, Jeff, well, how did it go? Huh? How did it go? I like how you do it, mate. Really, we love feeling. Not too bad. Maybe the You're unwell. Uh, You're unwell. I hope so, dear. I don't think Tommy Smith is the most successful racehorse trainer in the world, and today he is confident of capping his great career. His charge, Kingston Town, is Australia's greatest stakes winner and easily the best horse in the field. But this is a handicap race, so there's no guarantee. Gurners Lane has just won the Caulfield Cup with ease, and he'll be hard to beat. Gurners Lane is trained by Jeff Murphy. Tom, would you be happy to Cornella up between you? I'm happy any time. <laughs> what about you, Jeff? <laughs> I've got it in the trophy. I've got to keep the trophy. Good luck, good luck, Tom. OK, thanks, Mike. It's nice, this enormous, beautiful mare called Bianco Lady has never raced away from Sydney before, and nor has her strapper, Cora Betsima. The two are inseparable. Cora is gifted with horses and utterly devoted to her trust. How's that, eh? Strappers are the Cinderellas of racing. They work long hours. They have the drudgery of mucking out horse stalls. And they lack recognition in an industry that thrives on glamour and big names. But Cora loves what she's doing. And the chance to come to Melbourne and lead Bianco Lady in the Melbourne Cup is her dream come true. This is the Morris Brothers School at Eastwood in Sydney. 
Australia is the only country in the world where schools will stop for a horse race and betting is condoned, even if only in the form of a sweep. But if you think that's shameful, just remember we started as convicts and we still revere bush rangers. A humble schoolboy sweep? Why, that's positive moral progress. The Melbourne Cup is run over a distance of 3,200 metres, the metric two miles, which means that it's a race for stayers. Magistrate is 11 years old, which makes him about twice the age of most other runners and very much the sentimental favourite of the crowd, but only because he's been around so long. In truth, he's the most difficult, cantankerous horse in the race. He thinks nothing of biting or kicking anyone who comes within range. And that includes Ian Steffert, who owns Magistrate, trains him and straps him because no one else will. Woo, Carpenter, stop it. Righto, Laurie, that's pretty good. Righto. Thank you. Steffert is a blunt New Zealander and shuns the razzmatazz of racing. He likes to come in, yeah, win the money and I'll get out again. Hey, John, ten each way. And despite all his abuse of poor old magistrate, I think they're really pretty good mates. Forty minutes now before the race and Bianco Lady has been groomed for the fifth time. So there's little Cora can do except watch to make sure no visitors upset the mare. When your own nerves are strung out, it's not easy to stay calm. Soon it will be time to saddle up and lead her down to the mounting yard where the tension and noise are much greater and where Bianco Lady is most likely to play up. Around Australia, the countdown continues. Ward 14 and St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney is a typical example. It's all the more important to these men, whose lives are generally pretty empty. Jack, I brought your horse over. Hammer rent, do you know anything about it? Hammer rent, do you know anything about it? That's the horse. The sister in charge of the ward is the irrepressible Sister E. Try one, and what's the odds? 330 to 1. At least I'll be rich. What are you doing? Looking at the form. You're not going to have a bet, are you? Yes. Truly? Yes. How old are you? 12. Okay, what are you going to back? Um, dealer's choice. Why? Well, it's one over two mile in the Adelaide car. Yeah. And I think it's well weighted. I'm on Gurners Lane. What are the dangers? Um, obviously Kingston Town and last year's winner Just a Dash. You really take this seriously, don't you? Yes. Can you read form? Yes. You bet very much? Yes. Do you win? On and off. You gonna win today? Yes, hopefully. What's your name? Anthony Wilcox. Anthony, good luck. Okay, thank you. We might see you after the cup. Okay, thank What's you. What's that winner again? Dealer's Choice. Dealer's Choice. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, thank you. So far, there has never been a woman jockey in the Melbourne Cup, though at one stage it looked as though this year would see the first. Like the member stand, which still has a men-only preserve, the jockey's room has the atmosphere of an earlier age, when racing was the sport of kings, and there were kings around to enjoy it. Bruce McGinley is only 17, and he has never ridden in a cup before. Just two days ago, he was offered a ride on dry wine, an outsider at 250 to 1. The chances may not be good, but a ride in the cup is an achievement in itself. He might look lonely, but he's probably got half of Australia's teenagers behind him. 35 minutes before the race, Bob Skelton, a veteran of countless cups, offers a word of advice. And if your horse can stay, you're going to be right in the thick of it. So best of luck and a good ride. And if anything beats you, I hope it's me. David Haynes, Kingston Town's owner, gives his last minute instructions to Malcolm Johnston, the star jockey who loves to win. Their ambition is to see Kingston Town win $2 million. 
from this point on, the outcome of the race lies in the lap of the gods, the skill of the jockeys, and the staying power of these extraordinarily beautiful animals. Now, you can't win at all costs. I want you to remember that the Melbourne Cup is a prestigious event and we'd like it run incident free. Now, if any rider causes interference... The chief the steward Cup, of the Victoria Racing Club is Mr Pat Lawler. Last year, we did have to suspend a rider for a month. We get no pleasure out of suspending any boy, but I can assure you that we wish this race to be run cleanly and we wouldn't take it lightly any boy who causes interference due to carelessness. Now, is that clear? Yes, sir. All right. Now, we'd like to wish you all the best. May the best boy win, and hope we don't have any appointments after the race. Good luck. Mr. Lawler knows that with $310,000 prize money at stake, the temptation to win at all costs is strong. It's unusual, but he believes that special caution for the jockeys was in order. Kingston Town, number two, is led from the birdcage to the mounting enclosure. He has drawn a good position in the barrier, and the betting has firmed with the King at six to one, close to outright favouritism. Gurners Lane, my tip, is drifting out to eight to one. The odds on Bianco Lady are twenty to one. And for Magistrate, the odds are pretty generous. Well, it's now 25 past two. That gives us about 15 minutes to go as the horses come in for the Melbourne Cup. And you can really feel the excitement mounting. That's an old cliche, but it's happening right here. If it's not happening anywhere at Flemington, I suspect the car park is least affected of all. Some have called it the greatest picnic in the world. They come here for the Melbourne Cup, but it doesn't disturb the drinking or the fun in the car park. Every car space has been marked out, every square numbered. The idea is to establish a base as comfortably as you can and then leave it to go car hopping. The result is a 40-acre cocktail party where it seems everybody talks and nobody listens. <laughs> Each year sees the landed gentry fade a little more in comparison with the new wealth and power. A mothballed fleet of morning coats sailing sedately through the shoals of conspicuous consumption and personalised number plates. But the fact is that ever since our ancestors came out of the trees, we have loved to dress up and each is fascinated by looking at the other. When a horse called Comic Court won the race, the Melbourne Cup, I think that was back in 1950, I was a very small boy, and I was highly elated when Comic Court won. And when my parents asked me why I was so happy and excited about Comic Court winning, I replied that it was my horse. Well, it turned out that I had an Irish godfather who was a little glib, had been somewhere near the Blarney Stone, and of course it wasn't my horse. It was the biggest disappointment since learning the truth about Father Christmas. So I didn't own a Melbourne Cup winner. I'd be happy to own a Melbourne Cup horse, and I think that's the ambition of every race goer in Australia. No matter what the chances of these horses are, just to own one, that's to achieve a dream. Bianco Lady has been prepared with extraordinary care for this race by trainer Bobby Thompson, and she's looking great. Cora leads her round and round the mounting enclosure to the satisfaction of her owners and all those who have backed her. It's the final act in the ritual leading up to the big race. The jockeys will soon be called on to mount. 
that's a minion or that oh, voice? The Governor General, it is too. It's, it's got voice for eagle there. Every way at him, you might notice. Something. You reckon? Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> It doesn't look so bad, does it? No, I think he's uh, dizzy looking at the horses. And in the middle, the baby. Bruce McGinley, 17 and a mere 47 kilos. This race is tough and dangerous. He'll be changed by the experience. All right, put those books down now, boys. I know you've been waiting for it all day, so we won't be uh, holding you up any longer. Make sure you get that homework done tonight. We'll be moving down to watch the Melbourne Cup. Put all your books away now, please. Move out quietly. <laughs> because mine never does. I've got one of the worst horses at the moment too. I don't know who said this thing. I'm sorry, uh, Daryl. You know? On Melbourne Cup Day, horse racing is at its most respectable. Cabinet Minister Sir James Killen is part owner of the well-fancied Wellington Road. The start is now minutes away and we have every promise of a classic Melbourne Cup. The crowd is with Kingston Town, the champion, and there are 22 other horses to test him. The race callers, and Australia has the best in the world, have memorised the 23 sets of colours. The jockeys are edgy. The nation has stopped, waiting, apprehensive. And right now, this, quite simply, is the most exciting place to be in the world. The long shot Toha is upset by the huge crowd and is hard to control. Millions watch on television as young Peter Shepherd suffers the indignity of having to walk onto the course. Jack, can you get Mr. Newbury a chair? We won't let him sit on your knee, break your bones. Okay. Now while you're all here, for the next three and a half minutes, no one is allowed to get sick. Okay? <laughs> they tell me they're Wellington Road. Uh, did you want to be with that? Yeah, well, I can ride, yeah. Cook, G cook, uh, me with that, right? When you're closing the gates, uh, be careful that the magistrate... Magistrate, yeah, but make sure you don't kick under the gate or even around the area, right? Ain't done any kick well? Uh-huh. Knock ball right out one day. Suddenly, it's serious. The horses arrive at the barrier. The winner of the Herbert Power Handicap. You're right. Wait a minute. There's a dog on the track. Whoa, where? Mr. Watts! There's a dog on the track. There's a dog on the track, so it's a safety hazard. Kevin Blackmore, an ex-horse breaker, leads the team that must place these 23 highly strung thoroughbreds into the barrier stalls in minimum time and without injury. His country, literally, is waiting on him. 60 seconds to go. The champ, Kingston Town, goes in. There's a fortune riding on him. Go on, smart them up. Yelena and her friends have backed him, but like the stock buyers at Blaney and myself, they've also backed Gurners Lane. Young Anthony is on dealer's choice. Jackie and Fleur, still in the member stand, are backing the Sangster horse, 
triumphal march. Sister E has drawn dry wine. Cora has $10 on her love, Bianco Lady. Oh, what have we got? Get Yes, it's bright. Yeah, come on, Right, screw it down if you have to. Right, there's the next one. Smart enough of it. Right now, Brian. Magistrate behaves and goes in without a hitch. Wait, get in too. Get his tail over the gun. Suddenly, Malcolm Johnson calls for help on the king. Millions of pulses have suddenly quickened. Most of us have put something on the line. They are now under starter's orders. Melbourne Cup of 1982 and Kingston Town was one of the best to begin. The Anko Lady commenced smartly with LABG taking up a forward posse. They're followed then by Just a Dash, Gala Maskett out deeper with Karen Bush and Astral in. Drury Boy out very wide with triumphal marks as they move over the crossing the first time. Hey, where's my magistrate? We can't see, can we, Charlie? Who's going to lead them down the straight? The first time down the straight, they're travelling at 30 miles an hour and the 23 jockeys vie for position. It can make or break their chances. By Kingston Town. Wellington Road was next in the cup, followed by Mr. Digby over on the inside, then Dealer's Choice is getting well back. Triumphal March has been allowed to ease up on the inside. No great pace on out of the straight, they travel towards the 2200 metre mark, and it's Brewery Boy showing the way by a link. Now, Noble Comment was second, carrying Bush third. Perfectly poised behind them was Kingston Town as they wheel out of the back straight, go towards the Merriman on side. Rose and Thistle trapped out three deep on the outside of Ali Bijou. Bianco Lady got a check, went back there, passed by Astralin and Dry One. Good board coming together. Just a dash making ground when he's travelling wide. Dry One, Astralin, Dry One, going up Bianco Lady, Wellington Road. A length of a half to Emerald from Mr. Digby. Well back was Gurners Lane with Magistrate, Bar Max, Vice Raven, Dealer's Choice, second last. 1,700 metres left to go, and it's Brewery Boy showing the way by length and a half. Noble comment, carrying Bush third. Kingston Town running beautifully fourth on the inside. In the centre there was Ali Bijou, and they were followed then by Bianco Lady on the fence. <laughs> Wellington Road about to go forward out deeper with Astral in and then just a dash dry wine Amaranth. Just a dash. He's doing his dash. He's doing his dash. A length and a half farther back was Kingston Town from Port Carling over on the inside being ridden up Kingston Town coming away from the fence. A length and a half then to L.A. Bijou, followed by Astral Inn. They're followed then by Just a Dash, Wellington Road on the outside from Silver Bounty. And Gurners Lane starting to wind up and wide on the track from Dry Wine. Mice Avon sweeping around them, six and seven deep, followed by Amaranth. Dealer's Choice well back near the turn with Mr. Digby. Homeward bound, 600 metres left to go, and Kingston Town moving up on the outside of Noble Common. <laughs> They're followed in third place by Triumphal March, who's battling back. Right along the track was Astral in L.A. Bijou coming into it too. 400 left to go, Noble Comment joined by the King. Kingston Town hits the front. Farlap, Tullock, Kingston Town. A nation is ready to roar. It's Gurners Lane from the champ Kingston Town, but another drama breaks immediately. Trainer Tommy Smith could not see clearly, and at this moment, still thinks Kingston Town has won. Gurners Lane. Oh, 
Oh, and heaps. Heaps. Don't photograph me anymore. You ran second? No. Huh? Ran second. He ran second? Oh, oh yeah. Come here, it's easy. Yeah. Hard to tell from where we are. How far did he get back from? Oh, he wouldn't have got a better neck at the finish. Yeah, neck, did he? Yeah. You can't tell when they're racing. Oh, 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 damn! Oh, damn! Oh, 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 yeah, that was a right on the inside. Gurner's lane. The winning jockey, Mick Dittman, comes back knowing joy like he may never know again. He doesn't realise it, but he's about to be suspended for this ride. But that's okay, he keeps the cup. You got the... Oh, yeah, we've won. <laughs> Members of the winning Gurners Lane Syndicate have sprinted from the car park. A good run, but they're feeling no pain. The baby, Bruce McGinley, comes back. He beat five other runners home. Thought we had him for a while. Yeah. It was a perfect ride. And then when I went pink, you give me two lamps and I said, well, you're not going to pick me up. Beautiful run. Jesus, it was a good horse run. Must, I, I didn't see the other horse come out. Come right up on the fence. Yeah. Malcolm Johnston goes to weigh in. The King was gallant in defeat, a great run, a great ride. But second is little consolation. Behind his courageous front, Malcolm is feeling the pain. Fifteen bucks, mate. Thank Go on you, mate. on the See you again next year. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, we'll get back into the sale now. <laughs> I'm on a sale. Oh, she got in heaps of trouble. Come on, girl. Oh, that girl. I'm going to give her a hose now. Okay, how did she go? Oh, she ran fifth, but she got into a lot of trouble. Did she? What happened? Oh, she got squeezed up and all sorts of things happened. Never was talking about it. So I left. Was Neville pleased with the ride? Oh, yeah, she's in the sand down cup, too. Is she? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're a good girl, fifth in the Melbourne Cup. Oh, <laughs> gee whiz. Well, she seems okay after all of that. Oh, yeah, she was very excited before the race. Was she? Oh, was yeah. she? How yeah, long did she take to settle down now? Oh, not too long. She's all right now. Is she? Yeah. So, I'm pooped now. <laughs> 
Boot. Hold on, Let's down, fellas. Watch your bags. Watch your bags. Here we go. There we go. Thank you very much, Mr. Okay, come on. Well, it hasn't killed him, he's still eating, uh, so uh, I suppose that's yeah, one consolation, isn't it? It only had three... Privately, Ian Steffert was disappointed with yeah, Magistrate's right. performance. For the first time, the old trooper ran out of steam. It later turned out that he was suffering from a virus, and after one other race, he was retired to New Zealand, never to race again. fourth run, it is. So, uh... Ah, you old yeah. bastard. <laughs> we did have tickets. Yeah, but the German, we're going to fall into trouble. Oh, fair enough. You're Anthony? Yes. What happened to Dealer's Choice? No good. Run out of steam. Were you surprised? Yes. But I told you Gurners Lane. I didn't think he'd go two miles. Yeah. What do you think now? I'll hit all the brakes. Okay. Yeah, it was lucky. Got up on the rails. Now, what are you looking at now? This, is this the get-out bed in the last? Uh, yes. I think so. What do you like? Um, stars in your eyes. Why is that? Well, it's Colin Hayes and he's the top trainer, top jockey. So. Can you get your money back on him? Yes. Okay, he's my tip too. We'll stick together this time. Good luck, Anthony. See you. Okay, bye. I was a bit disappointed with the close today, generally, but I felt we looked fabulous. Like our hats look good, <laughs> our garments look good. I, I really oh, felt fabulous. we're a little bit avant, a little bit more avant-garde than the majority of the Melbourne people. Don't you think? How did you feel about it? Uh, there was a few really nice, bright coloured people that were up to date, I felt. Right. The rest was pretty conservative. Yes, yeah, I think so. It's always that way on the cup I day. I think so, because it's, it's a fun day. Yeah. It's a fun day, and yes. I think we fitted into that fun day, really. Yeah. So I feel pretty happy with what I want. Are you happy yes, with what I'm you happy. want? Yes, I'm happy with what you want. Oh, that's terrific. <laughs> 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 I think... Uh, <laughs> You're not quite what I'm looking for, actually. What happened? Just lost. <laughs> you lost? Yeah. You mean you came to the Melbourne Cup and you didn't back the winner? I didn't back the winner. Would you like to have backed the winner? Yes, I'd love to. Okay, you backed the winner. No, That's the winning ticket. You take it over to Griffiths, right across there, okay? You just backed the winner of the Melbourne Cup because you shouldn't come here and not go home happy. No, thank okay, you. you go and get it. <laughs> Be sure it's not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was good as Lane, so no, it's good as Lane. The unpaid. See, it's good as Lane, 160. Is it the unpaid? Yeah. How much you want? No. How much do you think you want? Five dollars. How much do you want to win? <laughs> Twenty. <laughs> Thanks very much. Good, Jake. The thing that I reckon that should have been here today is a bucket to catch the tears from the sellers and the losers. Yeah, well, I don't know where this is going, but you'll know that's a graze you're doing because they're always crying. It doesn't matter what happens, they're crying all the time. <laughs>
1977, the premiere of our action-packed drama series, The Love and Honor, which revolves around the lives and loves of the men and women of the 88th Airborne, a battalion of paratroopers whose motto is, fit to fight anywhere, anytime. For Love and Honor, coming up in just a few minutes. Thank you.